First, uh, Second Peter, rather, so Second Peter, chapter number one, and we'll begin reading here in verse one. Second Peter, chapter one, verse one. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus uh, our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from... Wherefore the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall." For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in present truth. Father, we are praying now that you'll help us as we look at this passage of Scripture uh, to be challenged with, our, uh, with regard to our walk with you. And uh, Lord, may we allow you to search our heart tonight. Uh, and uh, with regard to our growth, uh, Father, and how that's being demonstrated in our life. And Father, I pray again that you'd cleanse me of sin, help me to be filled with the Spirit, and to deliver your word in truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Simon Peter here, chapter 1 and verse 1, Simon Peter, he, he knew something, of course, about the matter of being alert. Uh, in his early years, as we read the Bible, uh, and, and uh, look at him as a disciple, it appears that he had a tendency to, uh, uh, to feel overconfident in time of uh, danger. Uh, when there was, and he would often overlook the warnings given to him by the Lord. When we read the Bible, we see that Simon Peter rushed ahead when he should have waited. And he slept when he should have prayed. And he talked when he should have listened. Uh, he was courageous, no doubt about that, but often uh, in his courage he was careless and he had the painful experience of, of falling in sin several times. Uh, the most uh, serious one, of course, uh, was uh, the night of our Lord's trial when he denied the Lord three times. Uh, however, thankfully, he grew in his faith and learned his lesson. Uh, he had, his, his spiritual growth was... Uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, it progressed in, in a hard fashion. Uh, he uh, certainly could have uh, maybe had a little easier go of his spiritual growth. He had to do it the hard way, but he learned. And so it's understandable when the Lord would use him to instruct us so that we don't have to go through the same things he did. If you look at verse 10, uh, he says there, Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in present truth. Uh, Peter, from experience, as the Spirit of God led him, urged us to be careful to hear the, uh, the exhortations of remembrance and reminder so that we don't have to... Uh, end up uh, uh, falling into sin. When a Christian falls into sin, they bring shame and reproach upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They bring shame and reproach upon themselves and their family and their friends and uh, their church. And they also run the risk of encouraging the unsaved around them to, uh, on to damnation because of the loss of their testimony. And there are people today but you may know some uh, that refuse to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because of the bad testimony of uh, a Christian they know. 
There are others, of course, who have never heard of Jesus Christ because Christians who fall and do not go and tell them. Therefore, it's uh, very important that we grow and increase in our faith because of our witness to the world. I'm glad tonight it's not possible to fall from God's grace and lose our salvation. Uh, but uh, the Bible speaks here in that, uh, of that uh, like precious faith there in uh, verse number 1. Uh, and uh, once we have obtained that, we are safe in the hands of the Lord. Uh, the Lord said in John 6 and 37 uh, that he would not cast us out. Uh, and, uh, you know, that he would keep us uh, forever in his hand, that no man can pluck us out of his hand. Uh, it is possible, however, for us to uh, fall in the grace of God uh, and then uh, to fail of the grace of God, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15 tells us. And far too many times we're guilty of doing that. Uh, we fail in the grace of God and we fall into sin. Uh, it may not affect whether or not we enter into heaven, but it will affect what kind of uh, entrance into heaven we have and uh, whether we receive reward or suffer loss. God assures us that, if we, uh, that we can continue to grow uh, to the point where uh, we don't have to worry so much about falling uh, and, uh, and dishonoring him. That's what, is being, uh, that's what uh, he's encouraging us to do. Uh, in these verses. And he goes on to say that those who do keep from falling can be assured of an abundant entrance, verse 11, uh, into the kingdom of our Lord. And so we ought to want to be careful to continue to grow. Uh, and uh, uh, how then can we do it? Well, there's some ways we can increase our faith and uh, keep from falling and make our calling and election sure, as he mentions there in verse number 10. Uh, and the first thing that we have to do in order to assure ourselves of an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God one day, uh, we're going to have to settle our faith once and for all. That, of course, has to do with the matter of salvation. He says in chapter 1 and verse 1, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with, faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, we've said so often and preach regular, and I think we need to keep preaching it. I don't have any intention on backing off on it, and that is not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, the, the first step to growing in faith is, to, is settling that faith in Jesus Christ once for all. I'm glad there's a true faith, and we can know it. We can know that we've obtained a like, like precious faith. Uh, we can know that we're born again, 1 John 5, 13, these things have been written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, that verse is a real problem for people that believe you can lose it. I mean, here's the thing. If you can't know, you can't know. Uh, you can't say that you can know, but you can't know. It don't make any Bible sense. Uh, so the scripture tells, by the way, all of that's not because of our goodness, it's because of the faithfulness of God, the promise of God, the power of God, the grace of God, uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses our sin, past, present, and future. So there's nothing in us to glory in. All the glory for eternal security goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we can know that we're saved. We can know that heaven's our home when we die. Uh, and, uh, and we ought to settle, every individual ought to settle that faith. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse 12, for, for this, uh, for, for, excuse me, for the which cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And of course, this, this like precious faith is faith that is in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, you see his name uh, mentioned uh, uh, three times in two verses in verse 1 and 2. He is the, he is the, uh, the focal point of saving faith. The Bible says here that, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. It says God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, he had to have been God in order to be our Savior. If he wasn't God, then, um, then he could not have died for our, uh, for our uh, sin on the cross. 
And though he may have died and paid for it on the cross, well, he couldn't have paid for it. He may have died on the cross, but if he wasn't God, he wouldn't have come out of the grave. And so Jesus, uh, uh, by the way, uh, of his own power, he said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. Amen, amen. That's our Savior. Uh, and uh, he is, he is uh, God in the flesh and uh, he is the Savior of all mankind. He saves from sin by giving us his righteousness. If you look at verse 1, it says that we obtain this like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. Now, how do we get the righteousness of God? By believing on Jesus Christ. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans chapter number 10 tells us. And so he saves us by giving us his righteousness through faith in his name. Uh, and then he saves us from fear by giving us peace. He says there in verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he is the focal point of this settled faith. Jesus Christ is. And, uh, and uh, that's true with regard to salvation. That's true with regard to our walk. Jesus Christ is our focus. Uh, it requires our faith in him, not faith in works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, uh, but also not by faith in faith. A lot of people think going to heaven, they believe. It don't matter what they believe. Can you imagine somebody thinks they're going to heaven because they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe the right things about them. Uh, and those are some of the ones, of course, and Jesus said it, they've been involved in all the religious works and doing all the ministries and all that kind of thing, but they, they don't know the Lord. So it's not faith in faith. The Bible says the devils believe in God and tremble. It's not faith in faith. It's faith in Christ. And this faith is, the, uh, is in the power of God. In verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Notice this, that God supplies for us everything that we need for life and godliness. That's a tremendous promise. You know the Lord must share, by the way, uh, we see the, 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 uh, uh, our mindset and the Lord's mindset in the nation of Israel when so often they would look to their neighbors rather than looking to God. You and I are guilty spiritually of the same thing. We look to everything else for happiness. We look to everything else for satisfaction. We look to everything else for peace. And God Almighty is in heaven saying, look here, I've done giving you everything you need. I have everything you need for life and godliness. If you'll just look to me, everything's been provided for your purpose in life and godly living. Everything comes through that knowledge of him. In the last part of verse number three, through knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We settle our faith in the power of God uh, and in, uh, in, his, in the promises of God. In verse four, whereby we are, uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of divine nature think about this how many times how many times do you and i make promises and can't come through we'd like to i mean maybe when we make them we have the best intention but then all kinds of things happen to us uh and uh, a lot of things happen through us and the next thing you know we can't come through on what we promised that'll never happen with god it'll never happen with him we have been given exceeding great and precious promises, and he's going to be faithful to them, one of which is that we are partakers of the divine nature. And uh, that is the presence of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer. Can you imagine? Which God is that good uh, but our God to say that we partake of his divine nature? And not only that, he says... Uh, that, uh, that he, he says partakers of divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When you're born in the family of God, uh, you, uh, you, are, you are born complete. God gives you everything you'll ever need for life and for godliness. Uh, he didn't say notice life and comfort, but for life and godliness... Uh, Nothing has to be added to what he has provided. 
uh, just as a normal baby is born with everything functioning properly, so it is believer as well. All that's needed is growth. But spiritual growth is not, uh, uh, it doesn't happen by accident. It's not automatic. It requires co uh, cooperation with God and application and spiritual diligence to grow. Now, so Peter says then the first thing that we need to do is settle our faith before we can grow it. And then we need to increase our faith. Now look at verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence. There's that word. It's not going to happen by accident. Giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue and to virtue knowledge, and right on down through the list. Now, somebody said, now look here, somebody may be thinking, this is Wednesday night. Don't you know who you're talking to? And sure I do. And so did Peter. Uh, look down here in verse number 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Always in remembrance. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church. It, it doesn't matter how long you've been reading your Bible. It, it doesn't matter how long you've been giving to the Lord or serving the Lord. Look here, God said we need to be reminded about some stuff. And so, uh, this matter of our Christian, and here's why. Here's exactly why. Because the, the tendency is, the temptation is, we almost could say the normalcy is that we get saved and uh, things, are, things are going and growing uh, and uh, uh, everything's coming up roses. And, and then somewhere along the line, spiritually, we kick the thing in neutral. And we begin to coast. The Lord said here that we need to add to our faith. Now, there is much more to the Christian life than salvation alone. Now, there is no Christian life without salvation, that's true. But there is much more to the Christian life. Hebrews 6 and 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and doctrines of baptisms and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are basic things. I have a book in my office written by a guy by the name of Mark Cameron. Do you remember him, Brother Mark Cameron? He came and, and did a two-week modular for us on uh, uh, something. Uh... I lost the big fancy word. Anyway, he came and did a modular for us on, uh, on studying and in, in, interpreting and, and preaching the Bible. And we found out when he came, he was an evangelist for a lot of years, but uh, he, uh, he um, was at one time, uh, I, I guess, the head of the seminary there at Temple. And he said, I was shocked. He said, these fellows here, man, they, they can study themselves stupid. He said, when, we, when I got back into and started working in the seminary, I began to find out that these guys had become a lot like those monks we make jokes about where they count how many angels can sit on the head of a pen. And he said, he said, he said I, had to, I had to go back through and I had to remind them what the cross was for, what the blood was for, what the Bible's for. What the fullness of the Spirit's for. Can you imagine? Come to the place where, uh, where they had just lost their mind. Uh, in, uh, in, in silly. It is possible to, to give yourself to silly study. Silly. Just has no impact on your life. It's not going to have any impact next to, to, uh, to, the, to the people in your life. It's not going to have any, any impact, eternal impact on anybody touching your life. It's just silly study. And some people think because they do all that and study all that and know all of that, that they're spiritually mature. But maturity isn't something that, uh, that uh, 
uh, that could be described by that kind of lifestyle. Some think that they're mature because they're separated from the world. Uh, some think they're mature because they're active in church. Some think they're mature because they're active in a ministry or because they've been saved for a certain number of years. Uh, usually a person who is active in soul winning is considered a mature Christian. But those alone aren't measures of maturity. Uh, think about it. An unsaved person can be separated from things of the world. Uh, and uh, they, uh, an unsaved person can be active in the work of the church. And many times, listen, the best soul winner is the new convert. Uh, and so neither is the length of time a person has been saved an accurate measure of maturity. Many Christians, uh, uh, unfortunately, do not mature. Others are only after many, many years. In fact, the matter is we all start out right. And at the, from the moment of our conversion and dwelt by the Spirit of God, we have access to God the Father. Uh, every one of us uh, uh, has God the Son as our mediator and intercessor in heaven. We have regeneration. We have justification. Uh, we have sanctification. We all have the presence of the Spirit, so we all have spiritual gifts that God is leading us into, uh, but the sad commentary is that not all Christians end right. All go to heaven, but they don't all go uh, to heaven with the testimony that they fought a good fight, that they finished their course, that they kept the faith. As illustration of that, in the city of Galatia, Paul worked hard to win those people to Christ and to teach them the Word of God. And many responded and gave evidence that, uh, that they were truly saved. But then something happened to them, and uh, he wrote a sharp rebuke to them, saying, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ, has, Christ hath been uh, evidently set forth, crucified among you. Something had happened to the Galatian believers. They didn't grow like they should have. And then, of course, we made several inferences recently uh, to the Corinthian believers who had similar problems. Paul had worked long and hard among them, and he tells them that clearly to, 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 to win them to Christ uh, to teach them uh, the things of God, but they were failing in their everyday Christian life. Uh, they had divisions among them. They had allowed an, adul an adulterer to stay uh, there and remain in the fellowship, but they took other believers to court uh, before unbelievers. They boasted of speaking in tongues and uh, other things that gave them preeminence in the assembly. Paul had to rebuke them in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 when he said, Are you not carnal and walk as men? Oh, what a sad commentary. Somebody said, oh, if I could just sit in the Apostle Paul's Bible study, I'd be a super believer. Well, the Corinthians sat there, and that's not how they came out. The Galatians sat there, and that's not how they came out. They had trusted Christ as their Savior. They were born again. The Spirit was in them. They were saints. Paul referred to them as so. They had every reason to be successful Christians, and yet... They were failing because they did not continually add to their faith and grow and challenge and stretch themselves for God. And he says here uh, in chapter number 5, and beside this, giving all diligence. And that's why not everybody grows like they should. Diligence. Diligence uh, is a persistent application of, to work or duty, a persevering effort, a giving of proper heed and care. And you know what I found out over the years? The people that want to keep at it, they do. And the people that don't, they won't. That's the end of it, isn't it? The ones that apply diligence to their Christian walk in life, uh, you know, uh, barring... Uh, uh, an early graduation to heaven or the rapture or some other thing, 
uh, you come back to, the, to, to church uh, in 20 years, they'll still be there. Perseverance. Perseverance. So the Lord encourages us to add to... Verse number five, he, he begins to give us this list. He says, add to your faith virtue. That's moral goodness. Uh, that, uh, uh, and, and moral excellence. It could be connected with such things as modesty and purity. Uh, it is the, it ha also has the idea of valor. And, and, and the, longer, uh, the longer we go and grow in the Lord the more virtue and the more valiance we ought to have toward God and for spiritual things. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, and a peculiar people. Uh, what we need are folks uh, filled with valor and not vanity. He said, add to your faith virtue. And the more you go, more virtuous. Then he said to that, you add knowledge in, in, in verse number 5. It used to look there where he said, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, uh, with regard to what I said a few moments ago, this does include learning factual information about God. We learn that, of course, from the Bible. Romans eleven thirty three 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, uh, who has commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We ought to be continually learning about who God is as we study the Bible uh, and its truths find, uh, find fertile ground in our heart. Uh, and uh, this type of knowledge will definitely have opposition. That's why the Bible says we have to be careful to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And once we have this knowledge of Him, we're responsible to, to, to share that with others. 1 Corinthians uh, 5, uh, 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And so he says part of our Christian growth is continually adding virtue. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea there again of uh, uh, of moral uh, uh, purity and excellence and, uh, and then add to that knowledge continuing to learn uh, about God and the truths of God. And then to that knowledge he tells us to add temperance. Now the, all these things go together of course. That word temperance has the idea of self-discipline and self-control. The, uh, the, this uh, virtue of mastering our desires and passions, especially uh, our, uh, uh, our sensual appetites. Temperance, put clearly, as I said a moment ago, is self-control. And Paul talked about it when he said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Uh, the more mature and, and grown up a believer is, the more they act like that, uh, uh, act that way, I should say. They maintain, they maintain control of themselves uh, uh, because of this matter of temperance and then dying to self. By the way, you'll never have self-discipline without self-death. You and I, that's part of our Christian growth. That's what John the Baptist said when he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's a dying of self. That's part of Christian growth. Uh, and we get over ourselves and we honor God. That's why Paul could say in Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And so he says we add this matter of temperance uh, and uh, that self-control, which then leads to the last part of verse number 6, and patience. Patience. That's the ability to bear up under. It is steadfastness and constancy and endurance. It is somebody that's not swerved to and fro, but they are deliberate in their purpose and their loyalty and their faith and their piety, even in difficult times in their life. Matter of fact, Romans 5 and 3 says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Part of growing up is learn how to be steadfast, to be faithful. 
uh, and uh, to, be, uh, to be how you ought to be and where you ought to be, uh, when you ought to be. That's part of growing up, isn't it? That's why we help our kids get a job so they can learn how to get up on time, show up on time, you know, work until time's up. Amen. Uh, and it is for us as well uh, when it comes to the matter of patience, bearing up under, continuing forward. Uh, and then he adds to that godliness in verse number 6. Uh, again, uh, all of these being connected to patience add godliness. Of course, godliness is piety and devotion to God and obedience to God. It uh, Literally, it means to uh, worship well. I love that. To worship well. Think about this. Look kindness. Now get this. You're going to need all the previous to add this one. Well, you say, now that's honoring. Now look. All of us can be honoring. That's right. And so, brother, I better have added some things to my faith to help me uh, be a blessing to the saints, to be an encouragement to the saints, to be a help to the saints. You know, a lot of people spend their life running around saying, help me, help me, help me. Well, who in the world are you going to grow up and help? He talks here about adding then brotherly kindness. And then watch this. Uh, he, he moves on then to this matter of charity. And that charity is to be, that's, that's the love of God. Now watch here now. That's the last one in the list. Um, yes, it is. It's the Bible. But I mean from a... Because it seems that that is uh, uh, the final achievement. Isn't it? The love of God. We, 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 uh, we are in the process of adding all of these other uh, things to our Christian life and growth uh, in the hopes that we can demonstrate the love of God, the charity of God, Father. Uh, you know, brotherly kindness uh, can be given and reciprocated. Uh, the love of God is a love, a self, an act of self-will that is sacrificial. That's what Calvary is. For God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus went to that cross knowing how they'd do it. Knowing how many people would reject him anyway. And he died for the sin of all mankind because of the love of God. Now, you want to know how to love a lost and dying world? That word charity is it. That's it. Um, Self-sacrificial love. And so look, we just skimmed that and purposely, purposefully just skimmed that tonight just to ask this question. Are you still adding to? Or have you stopped somewhere? Is your spiritual growth still in gear? Or are you coasting? You say, well, I need something to work toward. There's your list right there. Lord, help me add to my faith. Help me, help me be able to, and look what he says in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, watch now, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Well, now, that's kind of the way the Corinthians were acting, wasn't it? Because they weren't adding to their faith. And so what happened? They got blinded. They got, they got sidetracked. They forgot important things spiritually. And the same thing will happen to you and me if we don't keep adding, if we don't keep growing, and if, and, and if we don't exercise that word diligence in doing so. Add these things. What things? Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. 
And as we do these things, certainly then, uh, according to Peter's greeting here, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. And then watch what he says, and we'll pray. Verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Sure it up. Not your salvation, but your growth. You walk with God, your fellowship with Him. Look at the last part of verse 10. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. If somebody is, is constantly trying to add to their faith, there'll be a lot less chance for them to add to their flesh. And therefore, it's a, it's a hedge of protection against sin. And then look at the last part of verse, uh, first part of verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so one of these days, one of these days, we're out of here. Hallelujah. But then we're going to give an answer for life. Now, I have not been saved half so long as many of you. And I'm already nervous about when I get there what I should have added and didn't. How I should have grown but didn't. How I could have had a more abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, verse 11, but didn't because I wasn't diligent to do so. So tonight... Uh, for so many of you been saved for so long, been in church such a long time, can I ask you, are you still growing? Are you still growing? Can you sense your growth closer to God today than you were yesterday? More sensitive to the leadership of the Spirit today than you were yesterday? Learn, what did you learn about God today? That increased your knowledge of Him. Are you growing? For all of our lifetime that God's left us here, he, he intends for us to add to our faith. Are you doing that in your life? Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. Now, Lord, I certainly do not want to subtract. Unless it's something harmful, of course, from my life. Of course, we're talking about spiritual growth, so we're talking about positive spiritual strength, confidence, Lord. And so I pray that you would please help me to, to learn to diligently add to my faith these virtues. Help all of us, Lord, I pray, to be looking for opportunities to add them and then to see circumstances in life where you're seeking to open doors for them to be added and help us respond gratefully and submissively Lord to those opportunities grow us up that we might be strong in the faith and can and be strong uh, and stronger for the sake Lord of our witness to a world uh, that's without Christ and then for the sake of being a strength to our brethren. Help us grow, Lord, we pray, continually until you take us on to be with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The piano play through a verse here tonight just to give you time to meditate on this thought of adding to your faith. And I'm glad, of course, it's not referring to salvation, but really to sanctification, consecration spiritual growth how important it is that we diligently keep ourselves before the Lord Lord, again, we're grateful for the time in the house of the Lord. Thank you for clubs going on tonight in the back. Please, again, bless these truths. Bless the days ahead of us now as we come in uh, to the Lord's day. Use us, Father, to glorify you and to reach folks for Christ. And we'll thank you for what you do. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Good night to you, and the Lord bless you. We look forward to seeing you on the Lord's day.